Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And it might not feel the way we want to feel, but we are still blessed because as I often reflect on the Hawkins family classic song, Be Grateful Because There's Someone Else Who's Worse Off Than You. Be Grateful Because There's Someone Else Who Would Love To Be In Your Shoes. So if you're grateful today for God's blessing, can you just give him some praise right now? But for those in the sanctuary as well as those joining us virtually, we thank God for each and every one of you and pray God's richest blessings upon you as we enter into our worship on this evening with prayer. Worse off than you, but if God teaches us, we have to just uh, reshift our focus. And so that's what He has me for tonight. So to just shift our focus on who God is and His goodness, no matter what the situation looks like, even if we don't understand it, it's not even about us. So on tonight, Father, we come before you just to say thank you. Thank you again, Lord God, for just bringing us into your place, your house of prayer. Lord God, your word says, through prayer and supplication, we can make our request known unto you. So, Father God, right now, today, this moment, I say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. Oh, yes. Thank you for what you have already done. And thank you for the things that you're going to do, Lord God. Amen. Because we have to have an expectancy. And so we expect that you're going to do what you said. You just, you're that kind of God. And so you're a God that don't lie, and your word will never, ever come back void. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, I just thank you for this body of believers, Father. Amen. We keep coming back to this place, Lord God, because of who you are. Mm -hmm. Not nothing that we've done, Lord God. We thank you for just your grace. And then we can't take mercy for granted, Lord God, at all. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy because your word says that mercy is renewed yes. every day. So, Lord God, we say thank you just for that, yes. Father. Thank you for the under shepherd of this house, mm -hmm. the one that you have chosen, Father, the one that you ordained from the foundation of the earth. Mm -hmm. Lord God, there's times when we don't feel like it's so. But God, because of who you are, we have to go back to that foundation because of who you are. And so we're going to expect the victory every time because mm -hmm. Jehovah lives. Not nothing about us. It's because of who you are. Mm -hmm. So Lord God, in the name of Jesus, as you bring others into this place, God, remind them it's not about us. It's because of who you are. Because yes. we, our mind can be in a place where we feel so insignificant. But God, you remind us of who you are. And so that's what you put in my heart tonight. Because of who you are. Not because of what I've done. Not because of what i said. Not even because I'm standing in this place. It's still a place of gratitude. Because of who you are. So tonight, Lord God, we want to just shift our focus mm -hmm. to you, Lord. The true and living God. We have to remember, no matter what happens, that you are a true and living God. So we thank you for this moment. We praise you. We magnify your name because of who you are. Amen. 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 So on Sunday we 
We're in the Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And we look at the fact that there were people who brought little children to Jesus so that Jesus could bless them. But as, well, let's just turn to Mark 10, 13 through 16 and have someone read that. Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them on the disciples of Jesus, those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Saw the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Here I say unto you, since the old shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter the very. Thank you, if you will, for reading that in you know what verse 16. You know what that reminds me of? Uh, just uh, one more verse, verse 16. And, and, he, and he took them up into his arm and his hand upon them and blessed them. Okay. Now, what that reminds you of, Deacon Harold? The devil Lewis, Mr. Carver. All the older people at this church didn't let the young people do what they wanted to do around here. <laughs> if you were in the street, I remember one Sunday, my mama had gave me some money to put in Sunday school, and I'm going to the store. Mr. Lewis said, where are you going? You come on in, go to Sunday school, and that money your mama gave you, you're going to put it in Sunday school. And I've never forgotten it. <laughs> young, I still remember things that I was taught when I was small. My mom didn't send us to Sunday school, she brought mm -hmm. So we basically had a community of people who would take the children and bring us to Jesus. You know how sometimes when something goes on, uh, in, in, even in the corporate world where we're not sometimes supposed to speak the name of Jesus when something goes on and people need to come together, what do they say? We're getting ready to have a come to Jesus, come to Jesus meeting. Mm -hmm. Even though they might not really believe in Jesus, there's this idea that we have something going on that is be beyond our control, something going on that needs to be corrected. So we need to have a come to Jesus meeting. So on Sunday when we went over this text, we tagged it with the topic, don't block the children's blessing. Because sometimes grown folk don't always do like Deacon Harold remembered. They don't always bring us to be, but sometimes you'll find, help me Holy Spirit. Sometimes you'll find some, some of those ornery older people. <laughs> Uh, who who won't bring you to Jesus necessarily. They'll, they'll try to stop you from being what God has called you to be. But thank God for those people who have enough God in them to know that the best solution is to bring the children to Jesus. But now as we have looked at this story about the children being brought to Jesus, the disciples who tried to block them from getting to Jesus and Jesus' response to what his disciples did, I want us now to look at it from our perspective and think back about how we came to Jesus. So tonight, from that same text, our subject is going to be come to Jesus like little children. So if you see on your handout, I have verses 14 and 15 from Mark chapter 10 in the NIV translation, which says, when Jesus saw this, when he saw his disciples rebuking the little children, he was indignant, he was angry, he was upset, and he said to them, 
Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. We also found, find this encounter recorded in Matthew chapter 19 and in Luke chapter 18, rather, not 19, as I have printed. That was a, a typo, but it's Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. So who are the little children in the text? The Greek word that translated little children in the King James Version, or young children, is a word that could represent anyone from infancy up to age 12. As a matter of fact, that same Greek word is used when we see the account of Jesus healing or raising Jairus' daughter from the dead when he says to her, damsel, or Talsakumi, little girl, arise. It's the same Greek word that we see used here in the text that is rendered little children. So it could be a young boy, it could be a young girl, it could be a baby, but and then again, depending on which version of the, of the story you look at, in Luke, he actually refers to these children that were brought to Jesus as infants or babies. So the bottom line is the precise age of the children may not be known, but the implication is that they were small children because verse 16 says, Jesus took them in his arms, and he blessed them. So the implication of Jesus taking them in his arms, it gives the appearance that they were small children. But there are some things that we can glean from this text regardless of the age of the children who were represented, regardless of who it was who brought the children to Jesus. What we need to understand is that we need to come to Jesus as little children because Jesus said, if we don't receive the kingdom of God like a little child, we will not enter in. So, what are some things about little children that we, when people come to Christ, what are some characteristics of little children that new converts should share? see the vulnerability of the children. Why? Because it said, and they brought the children to Jesus. So the children could not come to Jesus on their own. They were vulnerable. They needed protection. They needed help. And their children want to know. They're inquisitive. Yeah. Okay. Deacon Harold. we appreciate coming to Jesus or coming to church, the first step is to do what? Because sometimes we, we, we think that they're not going to respond. They're, they're not going to react the way that we want them to, but how will we know unless we bring them? Certain foods, uh, I remember when I was in when I was in New Jersey and somebody invited me to a Chinese restaurant and I had never had Chinese food. I'm like, I don't want to go to a Chinese restaurant. I'm not going to like Chinese food. I barely like American food. 
But once I got there, once I tried. So, so we have children who are vulnerable. They, they ask questions. Once you introduce them to something, there's a good possibility that it's something. Now, fortunately, in, in Deacon Harold's example, it was a good thing that they were introduced to that they wanted to continue doing. But we have to be careful because there are some other folk out there who want to introduce them to some things that they might want to continue doing, but it might not be the best thing for them to do. Anybody else? What are some characteristics of children that, I say new converts, but really all of us as believers in Jesus Christ should have? something that we wanted to do and they told us that we couldn't do it and then because of being inquisitive children we asked the question why can't I do this and their response was and how many of us were satisfied with the answer because I said so well we might not have been satisfied with the answer but we knew we better not ask the question at least right then, but as Sister Lewis said, we'll, we'll come up, we'll come back around to it maybe later on or maybe on another day. But at that point, when they said because I said so, that was the end of it, Sister Sol. something comes up, he just do it. <laughs> it just, you know, and then ask questions later, why, you know, be mm -hmm. why.
and children are trusted. Because they haven't experienced enough to not trust. That's why you have to tell them about stranger danger. Because they're trusting. Why are they trusting? Because they haven't developed the reason not to trust. So they're going to remain trusting as long as they haven't developed the reason not to trust. So when we come to Jesus, we're trusting. And the good thing about Jesus is that he will never give us a reason not to trust him. Children, again, they have, they have no shame to their game. You know, we, we, we try to, you know, cover some things up. Um, and when I think about children and their, their innocence, their, in, in some, it's almost like a naivete. They, they, they just do things that we as adults wouldn't do. Uh, Sister, Sister Gail Wiggins is on the, on the line this evening, and when I think about children who had no shame to their game, I just can't help but think about my godchild who <laughs> uh, had no shame <laughs> to his game. Uh, clothing optional. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's just something because at that point he was free. <laughs> now we as adults, you know, we like, well, we know we need to. We need. The children, uh, Sister, Sister Bush says, they're innocent and they're curious. And, and, my, and like that, and when I talk, when I think about Alby in his innocence, he was, he wasn't like, oh, I'm a streaker. No, that, that, that was just Alby being Alby. <laughs> So, so children have a way of doing things. They're, they're not lifted up in pride. They're, they're humble enough to receive up, up until a certain age. They're um, <laughs> so so as believers, as Christians, de being dependent on Jesus, can anybody, does anybody else have anything you would like to share how we, sh we can be like little children when we're coming to Jesus? child, though, they're, they're a blank slate. They realize that they don't know everything, which goes back to the point, since they know they don't know everything, when something there's something they don't know, they're going to ask questions. But then, you know, we get grown, and, you know, you can't tell, you can't tell us anything. Okay, we, we get grown in the church, and you can't we know a few Bible verses and you can't tell us. Uh, we've always done it that way, so. Uh, so come to Jesus like little children. We'll look at a few scriptures. Uh, begin with Matthew chapter 18. Verses 1 through 5. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. This is the Holy Bible. At the same 
same time came the disciples to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as a little as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse five says, and whosoever who shall receive one such a little child in my name. So, Jesus says here, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How many times do we deal with folk in the church who are trying to be the greatest? What, what position can I have? Why didn't the pastor call my name out from the pulpit on Sunday? It's not about the recognition by man. See, that's where we get caught up. We want to be recognized by people. But we can be recognized by people and not be recognized by God. So we know that God does what to the proud? He resists. He resists. Another translation says he opposes the proud, but he gives more grace to the... So children are humble, again, up to a certain age. But while the disciples are asking the question, who's the greatest? If you remember... James and John, uh, Mrs. Zebedee tried to, tried to go to Jesus and say, can you put one son on your left and the other son on your right? The disciples seem to have an issue of wanting to know who's the greatest. But Jesus said, you have to humble yourself. In another place, he said, whoever wants to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, do what? Be a servant. Because as children, how many of us had a choice about what we were and were not going to do in our parents' house. We had to do our chores. We, when we were in school, we had to come home and do our homework, all kinds of things that we had to do in our parents' We weren't trying to run. If we did have enough nerve to try to run the house, then mom and daddy would humble us quick, fast, and in a hurry to let us know you're not running this thing. You are the child. When you get grown, when you're paying the bills, when you have your own house, then you can do what you want to do. But as long as you in my house, yeah. My mama took it a step forward, further and said, she came to visit me when I was living in New Jersey. She said, if I come to New Jersey, when I'm in your house, you still live by my rules. <laughs> but the children have humility. And Jesus is saying, if you want to be in the kingdom of heaven, you have to humble yourself. As uh, Sister Erica said earlier, as adults, there's some wrong behavior, some wrong thinking that we have acquired. But in order to change, in order to be converted and become a part of the kingdom, we have to be humble enough to allow ourselves to admit that we didn't have it all together. We didn't know what we thought we knew. How many of us know that it takes humility to admit that we're wrong? Even when we know we're wrong, it still takes humility to admit that we're wrong. So a little child is humble, and Jesus is saying we need to have that childlike humility in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Sister Erica? You know, down further in Matthew 18, down in verse 6, where it says, And whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Better for him to have a, mile, a heavy milestone, a millstone, as large as one turn 
so I know this means more than just that, but I'm just saying I always think of it because I know when I came up as a new believer, as a new convert, it's like I've been in church all my life. But when I got saved, it was so much more that I didn't know. So I didn't get the title. And I started calling into all kinds of thoughts and things. I didn't have nobody to tell me what was right or wrong. It wasn't my parents weren't Christians, but I really didn't go to them like that. So I went with other people who told me the wrong thing. And I learned real quick, you can't tell me, you can't go, you can't talk to everything. You have to find one person who loves God, who's wise, maybe two, to talk to them. So it's important to disciple the new believers. You have to continue to check up on them and see how their faith is Don't offend the little one. Jesus took, just like Jesus took offense at the fact that the disciples rebuked the ones who were bringing the little children, he's saying don't, don't offend one of these little ones who believe in me. Because if you do it, you may as well be drowned in the sea. And once you have a millstone around your neck, you're not coming up for air. And then there's verse 7. Sister Phillips? Yes, Pastor. When I, uh, uh, quite some years ago, I was going to be Sunday school, there was a Sunday morning, I dragged my car out. And this little girl that lived you know, next door to me, I didn't know the family. She was standing, she'd come out no matter how cold it was. She'd come out and she'd watch me and she'd wait and wait and wait and wait and wait So finally, one Sunday, I went over and I met the mother. Jesus. Right. See, that, that, that's key right there. It's one thing to try to bring them to church, but it's something different and more important than bringing them to church is bringing them to Jesus. Elder Gandy, good to have you with us this evening, sir.
know, but I appreciate that because they took the time. You know, they didn't make us feel like we were a burden or anything like that. And it was so much to do. You know, and even going to Chicago to my home church, some of those things took the time, you know, to talk to us. You know, it makes a difference. You know, and when you deal with, with children, young people, we don't forget stuff like that. You know, I'm 32 now, and I have not forgotten anything that I was taught. You know, and when people, uh, you know, I'm a people person. I talk and I hug you, kiss you, whatever. You know, and they, they, have, uh, they accept me, I'm kind to whatever, but I tell them that's my upbringing. Know, because we had examples who taught us how to be humble, how to be respectful, how to say yes, man, and no, man, yes, sir, no, sir, you know, things like that. And like you said, too, we didn't have the choice. We were going to do we were told to do. <laughs> <laughs> but there's going to be some consequences. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I'm enjoying that. And I love how Mother said about the child because she wanted to see Jesus. Yeah. You know, above, and I always tell that my church, above everything. Sure, we still realize that there's more that that we need to learn. And something else that I, that I was hearing is, as you were speaking, when it comes to the little children coming to Jesus, the the as a, as Jermaine said, the sweet church mothers, the, the those who cared about the, the children didn't just talk at them. To talk to them. In other words, build relationships. We, we try to drill heaven into them and drill coming to coming to church in them, but they don't see anything in us that makes them want to. As a matter of fact, if we come out in the wrong way, they're going to go the opposite direction. But when we humble ourselves enough to be able to build a relationship, and that's whether it's with a, a literal child or a figurative child, an adult who's coming to Jesus. We need to first build relationships with people as we're trying to get them to come to Jesus. But sometimes people look at evangelism as showing people how much we know. Showing people how many scriptures we can quote off the top of our head. But they don't see Jesus in it. So, the humility. The humility not only in the person who is coming to Jesus, but there's also a need for humility in the one who is like the, the folks who carry. They had to be humble enough to believe, I can't do what I need to do with this child by myself. I need to bring them to Jesus. The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, a very familiar passage here. And Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Um, 1 through 8. Jesus answered him, I assure you, 
Nicodemus, you must be born again. So Nicodemus asked the question, can I go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus says, no, you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be born of the water. You have to be born of the Spirit. And when somebody is born, they don't come out full grown. When they're born, they're a, a baby. So before you can get into the kingdom, you have to be a baby because you have to be born again. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin. But even though he was a ruler, he was a leader, he had to humble himself as Brother Glover has said, to become a follower. Uh, even as pastor, as a leader, I still must be a follower. So I can't get the big head just because I'm a pastor and think that I'm all that. I'm still a follower because Paul didn't just say, follow me. What did Paul say? Oh, I follow Christ. So even leaders have to be followers. So we have Nicodemus, his mind, even though he is a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin, someone who's versed in the law, he, his mind was on the natural but Jesus is saying, I need you to transition from the natural to the supernatural. I, I'm, I'm reading comments from Brother Glover again. Physical versus supernatural, or natural versus supernatural. But since Nicodemus didn't know when Jesus said you must be born again, what did Nicodemus do like a child would do? He said, what? Ugh. Those of you who re remember different strokes, he didn't say, what you talking about, Willis? He said, what you talking about, Jesus? What? How can this be a child? He, now he's in the position of being a baby in Christ, or, or becoming a baby in Christ, but he had to ask questions because he didn't understand. A member of the Sanhedrin, a ruler of the Jews, a leader in the church, but yet he had to ask the question. Sometimes we're just too proud to let people know that we don't know.
just good enough, I became free. You know, start asking questions and seeking, you know. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm smiling at uh, Brother Glover's comments. He says, the dumbest question is the one never asked. And a closed mouth don't get fed. Right. <laughs> That's right. uh, I, I could just hear Sister Barbara Coleman sharing those nuggets of wisdom with Brother Glover. <laughs> but there were times we have to know when to speak and when to be silent. We need to have that wisdom. Because there were times that Jesus would be asked a question. And you know one thing that they tell us? You don't answer a question with a question. But because Jesus knew the motives of their hearts when they asked him the question, because they were trying to trap him, then sometimes Jesus would just answer that. Well, well uh, Jesus, who do you get your power from? Well, who did you get your power from? He didn't always answer their question because he knew what their motive was. And sometimes people will ask you a question because they're looking for an opportunity to let you know what they know. It doesn't matter what your answer is. They're just trying to set a trap for you so then they can get on their soapbox and begin to pontificate about what they think. Okay, I, I, I'm, still, I'm still enjoying Brother Glover's comments up here. I'm glad I have my phone up here to see the comments. Some people ask questions, and when they receive an answer, the person that asks questions says, that's not right. Now, I'm going to ask Brother Glover if he, he would like to elaborate on that. Because I, I don't want to get the wrong interpretation and then have him come on and say that's not right. No, I'm just kidding, brother, brother. But if you would like to elaborate on on what 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 you were saying about that, when people ask questions, I think I understand what you're saying, but I I don't want to uh, to give the wrong idea. But again, uh, his comment was people ask questions and then they get an answer and then they turn around and they say that's not right. And I would think that that person already has an answer in their mind when they ask the question. And they're looking for you to agree with them. So it's not a discussion, it's not a conversation. Why ask the question if you already know the answer is not right? Sounds, sounds like the, the Pharisees were doing with Jesus. That they were trying to set him up. And they thought he was going to give a wrong answer. But they were dealing with Jesus so he wouldn't fall into the trap. And we too, like Jesus, must be wise enough to not fall into traps that people will set for us. On the other side of that, we need to make sure that we're not the people who are setting traps for somebody. Because sometimes we think, thank you, Brother Glover, for that confirmation. Okay, you said, you said exactly. So... We, we don't need to be the ones who are trying to make somebody, trying to belittle somebody, trying to make them feel less than just because we set them up with a question and uh, they didn't give the answer that we thought they should give. First Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So in the previous chapter, Peter was exhorting his readers to hold, to live a life that's, that's pleasing to God, that they would not just hear the word, but they would operate in the word. But so he says, in order for you to live a holy life, you need to lay aside malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking, and as newborn babes. In other words, you don't know yet. 
So in order for you to be able to live a life that's pleasing to God, you have to know what he expects of you. And in order for you to know what he expects of you, you need to be on the milk of the word. For a baby, you can put meat in front of them all you want to, but they're not going to be able to process it because they're not equipped to pro How are you going to give a steak to some? Well, how are you going to give a steak to somebody who ain't got no teeth? Now, maybe if you, you take it and you, you grind it up real good and maybe you know, put a little something in it to soften it up, they can handle it. But the thing about it is we sometimes expect people to come in on meat when they've just been born again. Like Sister Erica was saying, when she was a new convert, she wasn't discipled and people were expecting her to act like she could handle meat. And Sister Erica is probably not the only one listening to me right now who experienced both acting, expecting them to act grown when they were just babies. We, we need to get the milk to build up ourselves until we're at the point of being able to get on the meat. The only way we're going to grow as newborn babes is that we receive the bottle. We receive the jars of baby food. We receive the stuff that we're able to handle so that we don't end up getting discouraged along the way because somebody's expecting us to digest something that our bodies haven't matured to the point of the, or our spirits haven't matured to the point of being able to digest. Mr. Leroy Hayes says this message is very informative and necessary for the body of Christ in this day and time. The attitude of gratitude combined with childlike humility really moves the heart of God. It's not about our intellect, but how in tune we are with Jesus and the compassion that we must exemplify in our lives. God resists the proud, but give grace unto the humble. And one of the things I like to say Sometimes we try to impress people with what we know. People aren't going to impress with what we know. They need to see who we know. They need to see that we know Jesus, not just that we know the scripture. Uh, Jermaine?
know, and I need my fire back. And you know, and we knew something had taken place because at the end of the service, after everything was said and done, she let out a hollow and she just started laughing. And we turned around and she always go, woo! And she did that and we were like, okay, you know, now she was long enough to give me something for her. You know, and she ended up testifying and, and Sunday about it. You know, and one of the things that, uh, like the sister was said, it was the enemy was trying to shame her. You know, make her feel ashamed because I've been in church all the time and I have a title position. Mm -hmm. I've led others to Christ. Mm -hmm. And now here I am, the law, or feel like I'm out of law when I give it to others. So we can't be ashamed to say, Lord, even though I have been in church, you know, and I know I'm saved and I know I'm secure, I don't feel the same. And I, I, told, I told my apostle one, uh, one Sunday, I told her, I said, I don't. I don't even feel like coming to church. I said, that has nothing to do with my health or nothing like that. I said, I, I, to be honest with you, I had just been going to be here. I said, when I come, I'm literally pressing my way. And I've been asking the Lord to help me with that because they probably know me, though, that's not me. You know, but when you're honest with God, when you're home with yourself, you know, be honest with them. Lord, this is how I'm feeling. You know, I don't have to tell everybody else, but Lord, this is how I'm feeling. You know, I, 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 I know that this is what I need to do, but I don't have the desire. You know, there's sometimes when it comes to read my word, as much as I love the word, I don't want to read it. I want to go to sleep and stay. <laughs> give me that desire back. Or he'll wake me up to pray to the night, and I don't want to pray. I go back to sleep and he'll wake me up again. <laughs> I'm trying to go back. Do I get rested? You know, so we have to be honest with God. Lord, this is how I feel. You know, I don't understand. I always understand the root of why I'm feeling this way, but you know. And if you touch me, and if you lay your hand on me, and, and give me the desire that I can get back on the right track and see you some more. So, you know, I'm learning, even with ministry, you know, I don't always want to preach. And I have been times where I have literally lost my desire for ministry. I remember I, gave, I got my, uh, my ordination papers and all that stuff, all my credentials, and I took it to my ministry to try to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> I was just that done, you know, with, I didn't want to preach, I didn't want to be the church folk, none of that. And he had it right back to me and told me, he said, wait on God. And I was so upset, <laughs> you know. But I had to humble myself and, and tell God, Lord, I don't want to deal with the people. I feel some type of way about some of the people I'm preaching to. Mm -hmm. You know, and he had to really go down on the inside. Heal those hurt places and things and how I slept up under the rug and all that just so I could. Because sometimes we have a block in yes. our hearts that, yes. that keep us from desiring these things. Yeah. Yes. You know, and you have to tell God, Lord, remove the block. Mm -hmm. You know, this is my first time going to Bible study. And I think that's about five months. You know, and I drove past here. I parked in front of my grandma's house. I said, no, I'm going to go back tonight. And I came all in. You know, because I've been telling God, Remove, remove all whatever's keeping me from desiring to want to go to your house. I don't care what house. You know, remove that. Yes. And it's like when I drove out, I saw the cars there. I didn't have desire to come. <laughs> you know, and I can first made it block and came back. You know, but you got to be honest with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just something about that
children. And what what you have said, Sister Erin, for what you have said, and see, I'm, I'm going back and forth between Elder Gandhi and Jermaine, if you know that. But, <laughs> and, and I know he's not about the title. But let's get back to children. Think about a baby when something's not right with them. What do they do? They cry. They cry. They might not be able to tell you exactly. They may be wet. They may be hungry. They may be in pain. Whatever it might be. They cannot articulate what's wrong with them. But they're articulating that something's wrong. So every now and then we'll find ourselves at a point where we can do nothing but cry out to Jesus like little children. And what does mama do when the baby starts crying? Mama goes to, go to the baby, picks the baby up. Jesus took the children in his arms and he blessed them. Picks the baby up, tries to figure out what's going on. In the same way, when we cry out to Jesus, even though we don't fully understand what's going on ourselves, when we cry out to him, then he will show up take us in his arm, rock us in his arm. Oh. Mm. So sometimes we, well, well, again, looking at some of the comments, and uh, they're, they're, com they're coming so fast, I can't even read them. Ha! <laughs> so, uh, but again, we, we need to understand that sometimes in life, we, uh, I think it's a journey church that has on their side. I mess up, you mess up, we all mess up. We mess up. The question is not whether or not we mess up. Do we get up after we mess up? Do we learn from the mistakes we have made, as Brother Glover has said? Sometimes we might mess up. Sometimes we might backslide. Sometimes we might not feel saved. I think Sister Erica said that. We don't always feel saved, but thank God for the Holy Ghost when we don't feel saved, then the Holy Spirit will bear witness with our spirit that we are still the sons and daughters of the Most High God. So being saved is not always about feeling saved. So don't let the enemy try to deceive you with his lies that you're no longer a child of God. But I, I have a feeling that when I was growing up, there were some times that, that my mom and daddy might have wanted to disown me, but they didn't. <laughs> so, so again, we, we, we depend on the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. When we're going through, the Comforter will show up. When Jesus went through, he went through some stuff, but he went through, the angels came and ministered to him. Jesus, what did he come here to do? He came to give his life on Calvary. He came to die in our place for our sins, but yet the closer he got to Calvary, he said, Father, if it be possible. So if Jesus had a moment, then we shouldn't beat ourselves. But Jesus did not get stuck in the moment. He didn't get stuck in, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But he went beyond let this cup pass to nevertheless. You know, the nevertheless is just like a but. It turns everything around. Nevertheless, it's not about me. It's about you. And as children, we have to realize it's not about us. It's, it's about our father. We need to come to Jesus like little children. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Well, actually, we'll do 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto, uh, unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk. And not with meat. Uh, for here too ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. 
for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy, envying and strife, and division, and are ye not carnal, and walk as men. Mm. So, I've been feeding you. But right now, you look like a baby. You're acting like a baby. You sound like a baby. So I'm going to treat you like a baby. Now, Paul is lovingly correcting them. Because he's saying, I've been feeding you. But I haven't been feeding you what you can't handle yet because you're still a baby. And the reason I know that you're a baby is I can look at you and tell. Mm, the Holy Spirit will give you the discernment to know that you're dealing with a baby. So if you're dealing with a baby, don't try to talk to them like an adult. You know, some, some people like to be intellectual and use a bunch of big words with lots of syllables and you have no idea what they're talking about. What have they accomplished? Nothing. There has been a failure to communicate. So Paul said, since you haven't grown up yet, I'm going to keep feeding you with milk because you're not able to handle it. Because if we look up a few verses, we find out that the natural man, in verse 14 of chapter 2, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So in other words, we got to grow up. We have to realize that we're children so that we know we need to grow up. Sometimes we don't, you know, we're walking around in diapers, thinking that we but we need to let our bodies develop we need to let our just like we need to let our bodies develop we need to let our spirits develop and the way our spirits develop is that we stay on milk until we grow some teeth again I'm quoting from uh, paraphrasing from Brother Glover we need to let our teeth come in so we can chew the meat but until we can chew the meat, until our okay, now now I'm, I'm sorry, I just slipped into my my older age and started thinking about you know like in, in Ecclesiastes chapter twelve when the grinders are few. <laughs> but I, I digress. <laughs> you know when he says the grinders are few, that means your teeth falling out. But <laughs> but anyway, Paul is meeting them where they are. Even though maybe they should necessarily, may, may not necessarily be where they ought to be, but Paul is not talking to them where they ought to be. He's talking to them where they are. And, and my, my father, in his wisdom, when I was getting ready to do my first sermon, he told me to make sure that I spoke in a way that people would understand because he knew his son might be tempted to utilize that education that he had gotten. <clears throat> Make sure that everybody can understand you. And to this day, I have people coming to me and saying, that was a good sermon. It was so simple a child could understand it. Good. If a child can understand it, then an adult showed up and could understand it. But we need to meet people where they are. So what if they've been in church 40 years? They may still need some milk. Because they haven't developed yet for the meat. However, we've been talking about children. Come to Jesus as a child, but don't stay as a child. Y'all would probably talk about me pretty bad if I was if I came crawling into the church wearing a diaper, drooling, 
and doing things that somebody who's almost 60 years old should not be doing, y'all would be looking at me strange, wouldn't you? <laughs> you would ask me what's wrong with me. You would be the only one. Someone might not ask you, but they'd be thinking, what's wrong with him? What institution do we need to commit our pastor to now? So, we start off as children, but we shouldn't stay children. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. So we have some folk who, and, and there are scholars who debate about whether this letter was written by Paul or by someone else, but that we're, we're not debating that tonight. But, but Paul, or whoever the writer is, is saying, there are some things that I need to tell you, but I can't tell you right now because you aren't understanding what I'm saying. And you ought to be teaching right now. You ought to be on milk. You ought to be mature. But at the time you ought to be grown, you need milk. When he says you need somebody to teach you the elementary truth or the basic principles of God's word, you should be on meat right now but I have to give you milk. Again, it's not about how long you've been in church. It's not about how long I've been in church. I, the next year will be 30 years in ministry for me. I ought, to be on, I ought to be able to deliver some meat after 30 years in ministry. But just because I've been in ministry for 30 years, that doesn't mean... Oh, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm about to get in trouble. I don't have a problem at all with a good Baptist preacher sermon. I don't have a problem with them closing out the sermon when he died until the sun refused to shine. He died until the stars fell out of their sockets. He hung there. He hung his head in the lock on the shoulder and he died. They took him down for the from the cross and all night Friday night and all day Saturday and all night Saturday night. He was in the grave, but early Sunday morning he got up with all power in heaven. I don't have a problem with that clothes. I enjoy it. But my brothers and sisters, the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again is not me. That is a basic principle that we had to accept before, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. That is milk. So I need more than milk. Every now and then I need something I, oh, don't just give me the gravy if I don't have some meat to go with. So we don't need to stay children. We need to grow up. Those who are able to understand, as Brother Glover said, the mysteries of God. There are some things that he will reveal to us in due time, but he's not going to reveal it to us if we're not able to handle it. 
As a matter of fact, when you think about the fact that Jesus taught in parables, even when he taught in parables, there were times that he had to explain the parables further to his disciples. Why? Because when he spoke in the parables, he confounded the wise, but yet those who were humble enough to realize they didn't know everything were able to receive what he was saying. There are some folk who are ever learning, but never coming into the knowledge of the truth. So it's not about how educated we are. But we need to, what? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I cannot stand up here and give you my opinion and expect you to grow on my opinion. Let me press it a little further. I can't expect you to grow on my interpretation of the word. The only way you're going to grow is on the Holy Spirit's revelation of the word. Not my, in, my in, because no scripture is of any man's private interpretation. So some people think they're giving meat, but it's their private interpretation. That ain't even milk. Oh, I, so we need to make sure that when we are at a point where we ought to be, we need to grow up. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware that ye also be led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So here in 2 Peter, he's, he's letting them, Peter's letting them know about looking forward to, to the return of Jesus Christ and living our lives in such a way that we're ready when he returns. But when we get to verse 17, he said, Now that you know these things, beware lest being led, led away with false teaching. That's the error of the wicked, false teaching. People coming along and telling you that what you believe ain't so. Then you fall from your steadfastness. Now, falling from your steadfastness means that you're no longer secure about what you thought you believed. It's not saying that you've lost your salvation. You just lost confidence in what you had been taught before. But see, that's why we need to know the word for ourselves so we're not blown around with every wind and doctrine. We need to know it for ourselves. And like I said, if we're on milk and then somebody comes along with what they perceive to be meat, and they come to you and you say, that sounds pretty good. Oh, now, a nice, thick, juicy steak for those who like steak. There might be people who don't like steak and understand that. So now I'm going to talk about my nephew for a moment, where he and I have a difference. When it comes to steak, both of us like our steak brown on the outside. Where we differ is that his doesn't have to be brown on the inside. But I want mine brown all the way through. So there's the meat in front of you. When you look at it from the outside, it looks like meat. But when you cut it open, there's something different on the inside. So what am I trying to tell you? It might look like meat on the outside, but the question is not what it looks like on the outside. The question is what's going on on the inside. So how do I discern what's going on on the inside? By growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to know him 
for ourselves. Don't remain children. He said, grow in grace. Mm. Now, Brother Glover, don't be bringing up stuff like this when it's almost 8 o'clock. That's a whole other Bible study. Oh. <laughs> King James ver Version versus New International Version, different interpretations. We, 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 we can't get into that tonight. <laughs> but I actually saw something on Facebook today about King James Version versus New International Version, and where there are some things that are in the King James Version but taken out of the New International Version. Not only that, but they continue to modify the New International Version to take some more stuff out than from the original version of the... <clears throat> but we need to be able to stand firm on the Word of God. We need to know that we know that we know. And the only way we're going to know that we know that we know is that we have to get into this word for ourselves. Yeah, be on milk as long as you need to be on milk, but don't stay on milk. I never liked milk anyway. I'm talking about natural milk, not spiritual milk. I don't know if I'm lactose intolerant, I just don't like it. But anyway. Put a hamburger in front of me and y'all know the rest of the story. <laughs> so, we should come to Jesus like little children. We should come in humility. We should come with an open mind. We should come asking questions, wanting to know more and more about Jesus. We should be able to avoid those folk who try to block us from getting to know Jesus. Some folk want us to get to know church, but they don't want us to get to know Jesus. Some folk want us to get to know religion, but they don't want us to get to know Jesus. My brothers and my sisters, our job is not to introduce people to religion. Our job is to introduce people to Jesus. And when they come to Jesus like a little child, he will take them in his arms and bless them. But once we get in, we need to grow up. So, um, Mr. Hayes says it's about knowing we are sealed. We may not feel God or even hear God at times, but we remain fully persuaded in the gospel of Christ that brought us to salvation. Anybody ever felt like you were not hearing from God? Yes. You feel like you're in the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament and God is just being silent. You're praying, pr praying and you're crying. You're praying and you're crying. Yeah, I'm thinking about standing. <laughs> Pray and cry, pray and cry. But after you've done all you can, what do you have to do? You have to be able to... So let, let me borrow from uh, Bishop Paul Morton for a moment, the song that Deacon Robinson led many years ago. I'm still standing. I'm still hoping. I'm still, I'm still trusting what I believe. I'm motivated, fully persuaded that I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm standing on the word of God. So when you have your foot on the solid foundation,
just reminded that that form the footprint in the sand. At the time that you only see one set of footprints, that's the time that you have to trust. And even you look back over your life and say, Lord, why is it at the darkest times in my life? The most difficult times in my life. I look and I only see one set of footprints. And you might not have even realized it, but that was the time that he picked you up and carried you because you couldn't walk on your own. We've all had those moments, haven't we? We're not finished having that. As long as we're on this side, we're going to have those moments. I have... I have moments that I get ready to pick up my computer and type a letter of resignation. Okay. Haven't done it. I was like, well, let me just have a form letter ready to go. All I have to do is fill in the day. <coughs> but I didn't call me here. So I can't, call. well, I can. He would let me. But I want to be in his perfect will. I don't want to be in his permissive will. So yes, there are going to be times that we are at the end of our rope. There are going to be times that we feel like giving up. There were times, again, going back to my childhood, there were times that I just didn't feel good enough. I felt like giving up. But I had parents who were there to encourage me and to push me and to keep me going. We have a father who at those moments. Stop looking at what other people are going through too. Because my sister is here and she can confirm what I'm about to say. Mom and daddy, y'all don't love me. Y'all love those rich. <laughs> I had the nerve to think because my skin was darker than my brother and my sister than my parents. Stop looking at what other people are doing and comparing what's going on in their lives to what God is doing in your life. Because God could have something greater in your situation than he has for that person who you're looking at and being jealous of and comparing yourself to. But as children, now, I, growing up, you hear, hear me? Growing up, I said, as a child, I said, but I became a man. Come stand at my boss and big sister at one time. <laughs> then my poor brother, the middle child, he's trying to be the referee between us. Okay, I'm putting too much out there. I'm putting, I'm putting, putting too much stuff out there. Let me leave you alone. But don't look at other people to try to determine what your relationship with God should be. Because they are my brother and sister and I, we had the same parents, but each of us had a unique and special relationship with them. My father would always say, what you do for one, you do for all, but it didn't always look the same the way he did it for my sister or the way he did it for my brother or the way he did it for me, but yet he was still doing for all of us. As we get ready to uh, close out to uh, this evening, uh, Brother Glover is asking for prayer. He has a Zoom call through DCFS with Ali J tomorrow at 4 and Friday at 345. He's praying that we will agree in prayer with him that God's will be done. Brother Gaines.
I don't respond a lot on Facebook. I don't react a lot to Facebook posts, but Jermaine has been through. He is a walking miracle. A miracle. Lord ordained that you would be here tonight yes, to, me, to share yes. your testimony. I'm sure that we have uh, a lot of the, the same friends. Uh, good hope that, and you have a lot of the same friends on Facebook. But somebody who has missed your testimony, they're getting it tonight. Knowing that God is still in the healing. Yes. So thank you for sharing. Father, we come to you this evening. We thank you for the privilege of being your children. Father, that we will be obedient children, that we will be humble children, that we will be inquisitive children that are willing to learn more and more about you, that you will draw us closer to you as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, continue to let your word flow. You said in, in the in your word, that your word shall not return unto you void, but it will prosper in the thing where to you send it, and it will accomplish that which you please. So, Father, as your word continues to do what you have ordained it to do, let us be receptive to your word. Let your word make our, a difference. We know your word is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So continue to with with better than surgical precision, continue to work on us, Father God, on the inside so that we may be more and more like you. Father, we lift up Brother Glover and Sister Eileen before you right now. Father, let your will be done in that situation. We know that they have been through a lot, not only over the years, but especially this year, over, over these months so far, Father God, that you will just continue to touch their hearts, touch the hearts of their family, Lord God that they may all be able to work together to do what's best for Ily, Father God. That she will be able to, to continue to grow and continue to grow closer to you even as she grows closer to her family. Father, that you will be in control. Ride the airwaves of that Zoom call. 
on tomorrow and that Zoom call on Friday. Let your will be done, Father, as we pray in the model prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we lift up Jermaine before you. Thank you for what you have brought him through already. And as we prepare to go through surgery on the fourth, Father God, that you will guide the hands of the, of the surgeon, that you will guide the hands of all of the medical. We pray right now, we consecrate that operating room right now in the name of Jesus. We release the power of your Holy Spirit even now, Father God, that you prepare that place and <clears throat> that you will work in such a way, Father God, that even before Jermaine goes into that room, somebody else who goes through that, that operating room will be able to feel the power of the anointing even as you prepare it for him, Father God. Let somebody, if somebody who the lost soul goes into that operating room, let them meet your spirit of adoption even as they prepare for the surgery, Father God. And Father, for other prayer requests, we, we had a young man who came before, before the service, our brother Brett, who came asking for prayer as he, he lost his girlfriend who was hit by a car on Highway 165 in Ball. Father God, that you would allow him and that family to be strengthened in their time of need, Heavenly Father. Comfort them, because your word tells us that you are the God of all comfort, who is able to comfort us in all of our troubles. Father, for those who may not have spoken prayer requests, you have searched us, you have known us. You know our needs, you know our heart's desires. So Father God, just bless us according to those things that you see we stand in need of. For your word tells us when we delight ourselves in you, you will give us the desires of our heart. So, Father God, place your desires, the things that you desire for us to have, place them in our hearts so that we might be in agreement with your will, your word, and your way. Thank you for this fellowship that you have allowed us to have on this evening. We thank you for those here in the sanctuary as well as those who are watching online, that this word will be a blessing unto them and they will be able to walk as your children, Heavenly Father. And now as we come to the close of this, this worship, we ask that you will give us traveling grace and arrival mercy to our various destinations. And we will continue to acknowledge that all the honor, glory, and the praise belong to you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, children of God. <laughs>